Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, all to the first episode in a series of webinars uh, showcasing the interesting and wonderful use cases and benefits of Copernicus. Uh, my name is Pedro Sauwald. I am a manager in the Copernicus Support Office and I'll be your facilitator today. So this first webinar will look at exploring the full climate data value chain and so we'll outline the status and evolution of the climate data that Copernicus acquires and makes available. It will also highlight how organizations and individuals alike may take advantage of Copernicus climate data in their response to climate change under a full free and open access to the data policy. So, you know, uh, during this webinar, we'll be using Slido for live questions. Uh, it's to the right of your screen and you may uh, respond to the questions that pop up um, that we'll be asking. And also you may ask questions based on the content presented today. So please feel free to type in your questions so that we may answer them during uh, the questions and answer the uh, sections after uh, each of the presentations. Uh, so as an initial icebreaker question, we'd like to ask you, uh, what sector do you currently uh, work or study in? You should be able to see that uh, to the right of your screen, so please feel free uh, to enter that. We'll give you a moment. That's good. We see some answers coming through. Water and climate seems to be a big one so far. Thanks for that. We'll keep that going. And uh, p please feel free to keep answering while I share my screen and I will show you uh, the agenda for today's webinar. So, uh, you was on the agenda today, you'll see that we have an introduction from uh, Hugo Zunker of the European Commission, uh, who will give a brief presentation introducing um, uh, the Copernicus component of the uh, uh, EU space uh, program. And then Chiara Cagnazzo of ECMWF, the entrusted entity for the Copernicus Climate Change Service, will give an overview of the service. Uh, this will be followed by two uh, exciting presentations from uh, two companies that use C3S data information. So Juan Jose Sainz de la Torre of Predictia and Gil Liscano of Climate Scale uh, will uh, present um, some uh, use cases of C3S uh, data in their organizations. And there will also be opportunities for questions from the audience. So please feel free to type in uh, a question in the Slido window. I'll just stop sharing my screen. So thank you for letting us know what sector you work or study in. We'll uh, stop that poll and we'll ask you a final question before we get into uh, the presentations. What we'd love to know is how knowledgeable are you on Copernicus? So on a scale of one to five, it'd be appreciated if you could please rate your knowledge about Copernicus. Um, we'll give you a moment to do that. See some answers coming in. It appears you're all quite knowledgeable. It's good to see. So we see so most of the ratings on the four uh, out of five. So that's uh, good to know. So we'll um, hopefully uh, showcase and outline some interesting information for you all uh, to learn something new today. Thank you for participating in that. All right, so let's get started. I would like to introduce Hugo Zunker. So Hugo works in the Earth Observation Unit of the European Commission's Directorate General for Defence, Industry and Space. He is in charge of the Copernicus Atmosphere and Climate Change Services and is coordinating between the Copernicus Services and across the Copernicus component. Before joining the Commission, Hugo worked with different employers in the domains of satellite navigation and the manned space program. So now what I'll do is I'll hand over to, um, to Hugo. And Hugo, you should have a request to unmute and please feel free to share your screen and uh, present. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I will try to share um, share my slide. Let's see if I manage to do that. Um, can confirm we see it, Hugo, thank you. I'm not sure. I'm a bit lost here what I see, what you see, but okay. Uh, 
we see PowerPoint open. Okay, so very good. So, so you see the cover slides, the first slide. Uh, uh, sorry, no, we just see the the range of slides. So you may have to uh, just swap your screen. Great, looking good now. Looking good. Yeah. Okay, I don't touch anything. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, well. Uh, so I got a couple of minutes to speak a bit about the Copernicus. So Copernicus is um, basically the European Union's Earth Observation and Monitoring uh, Program. So um, this means that uh, we operate, or Copernicus is part of the space crop program. So I hope this moves now. Uh, so um, the space program of the European Union has Con, uh, multiple components, so about satellite navigation, about Earth observation, um, and a couple of new things about uh, space situational awareness, uh, and as well about secure communication. And so this is a bit the, the overall framework. So this is uh, about uh, 16 billion euro in total for the current seven years period of the EU space program, of which Copernicus has about 4.5 billion and with ESA contributing roughly another 30% of that uh, from their own funds, in particular for the development of the satellites. So Copernicus is uh, having uh, to a large extent a satellite component, space component, which is uh, building, developing, launching, operating, number of satellites. So at the moment we have so uh, six or se uh, sorry seven or eight satellites in orbit. Uh, we're using then other satellites as well to to complement the data we're getting from our own satellites. So that's uh, a bit the space component. And then I would like to say it's a very uh, important part of the Copernicus program, and maybe even the the, the, the part but that makes it most unique is the services. So there are a number of thematic services, which basically build on these space observations, combine it with, firstly, with other observations, maybe from uh, from ground, from in situ uh, databases, other complementary, uh, complementary data, uh, say population data, economic data, um, and I'm sure you will see a couple of examples uh, uh, later uh, by the next speakers. And I'm sorry, so Hugo. I'm sorry. So and this Earth observation data really into value added information, which can be used by policy makers, by implementers, by administrators uh, in, across the member states at regional level and so on, to see how they are doing, how their policies are doing, what could be uh, good measures to, to deploy uh, in the future. So um, there has been last week, there has been um, uh, the Earth Day, there has been uh, the European State of the Climate has been published, and uh, I could not resist to to share this a bit with you. So here on this slide, um, excuse me, Hugo. Sorry? Excuse me, Hugo. Sorry, uh, we can't see ah, the, uh, don't see the, the slide. So you want to uh, just a different screen? If you could please. Um, maybe. Yep. So we see that, but what you need to do is in the top left-hand corner you'll need to change the screen that you're sharing. So uh, not, uh, to the next option to the right. Yep, click on that and you should be able to switch uh, screens. Swap screen. Does this make yes, a difference perfect. somehow? Yes, we see it now, that's great. Sorry okay, to Okay, I'm sorry for that. So I was talking to the void uh, slide here. Okay, but anyway, so I, I don't want to go into detail here, but these are basically two of the key uh, carbon uh, key greenhouse um, greenhouse gases, as everybody uh, knows probably by now. So here we have carbon dioxide, methane, and you see basically the development in the concentration. And uh, the terrifying thing about this slide is basically that that it's a constant rate of the of the concentration. So this means basically that we all together as a world, uh, as mankind, we, we haven't yet found uh, policies who, who really curb the and, and, and level the concentration at, at some point, and, but that the concentration for these gases, gases are still, still increasing, that's quite worrying. No? I will not go into detail here, uh, but um, of course, as a consequence of this rate of greenhouse gases, you see 
Here at European level, at regional level, you see already quite a number of effects uh, of different kinds. So you see, I don't know, heat waves, heat stress, and this sounds, you see something uh, like um, like uh, significant flooding last year you had in, in Central Europe, so uh, Germany, Belgium, uh, Netherlands. Um, and uh, a couple of other other effects or so heat records uh, wherever you look, basically. So this means that uh, temperature globally is rising, that the sea level is rising, and that the ice sea ice content is uh, reducing uh, continuously. So on this, pardon. So on this slide here, I I would. Simply try to scope a bit. What are we going to do? Or what are we doing at, at the moment already with Copernicus? So we are providing on one hand um, climate monitoring. Uh, so we provide quite a number of data, significant amounts of data uh, on all various indices for climate service. So we are projecting that to help us to predict a bit the futures, and we are in particular. Uh, trying to connect this with other other communities and all of this really to have um, a, a future climate resilient society and to meet the the, the, the goal of having um, the Europe uh, climate neutral continent uh, by 2050. So this is really an exciting service uh, to work with and it's it's really linked to to an incredibly number of of policies which are collecting and collectively represent the European Green Deal um, policy of the European Commission. So this is just a bit to set the scene for I think what what uh, Chiara is is going to say uh, say next. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that presentation, Hugo. Uh, I'd like to just apologize to the audience for the technical issues. Hopefully, uh, we, I'm sure we're all used to the uh, technical difficulties that we've been experiencing with online platforms for the last uh, couple of years. We'll uh, uh, try to make sure that these do not continue for the rest of the webinar. Uh, Hugo, if you could please um, uh, uh, unshare your screen, that would be appreciated. Um, we also have another question for the audience in the Slido window. Uh, the question is, if you use climate data for your work and research, so if you could please um, indicate your answer in the poll, that would be great. see some answers going through. That's great. So in the meantime, what I'll do is I will introduce our next speaker, who is Chiara Cagnazzo. She is the Sectorial Information System Manager at ECMWF, which is the entrusted entity for managing the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So Chiara's role takes on the challenge of identifying and transforming user needs from across different sectors to foster the provision of usable climate-derived data and information. All right, so before I hand the floor to Chiara, we'll just look at the answers from our Slido question. If the audience uses climate data for work or research, vastly majority of yes, so that's great to know. So uh, I guess we have a, a lot in the audience who are well experienced and well knowledgeable about the content that we're um, uh, talking about. But for those who said no or not yet, I hope you learn something new. All right, so We'll hand the floor to Chiara. Uh, Chiara, just let me know if you're having any issues with sharing. I think we can see the screen. So first, can you hear me properly? Okay, can you hear good. you properly, and, loud and clear? And can you Thank see my, you. my screen now in full mode, not in presentation mode, with no strange lights around so can you see me my screen please? yes okay. yes i can see it's not flashing either so thank you the floor is yours thank you very much thank you thank you very much for for this nice introduction and thank you hugo for for the for the introduction to the to the entire uh, copernicus program uh what i'm going to to do right now is just a quick introduction to what we're going to listen um in in the next presentations in practice this webinar is really focusing on on showcasing with examples uh, which is the added value of the climate derived information and in practice, um, which is the data value chain that goes from the earth observations, from the earth modeling, often used in a synergic approach into a tangible benefit. So how to go from data product, from, from data processing uh, until, I mean, the, field, the full, full final user uptake. Um, 
So uh, the Copernicus Climate Change Service is one of the Copernicus services that is dedicated to, to deliver information about climate variability, about climate change to society in order to support adaptation and mitigation strategies. And of course, the journey um, starts with the data and, and managing the data in an operational way is one aspect of the data value chain. Um, here at the Copernicus Climate Change Service, we are talking about managing one petabyte of data every two weeks, and we are facing a really growing number of users. And for whom uh, is a bit expert um, about the Copernicus Climate Change um, data that we service, uh, we cover data products that um, look at the past climate, data that uh, look at the near real-time climate, but also the future possible climate evolution. Of course, we realize it through uh, models. And uh, if you are again a bit, um, if you know a bit about our products, um, one every two users is a user of the reanalysis products. And the reanalysis is this data set that, that combines data, uh, model data with observations from um, across the world and gives you this globally complete and consistent data set that, of course, is made by using the law of physics. How uh, this is done. So, the, the reanalysis data that is one of the most relevant products that is available at the Copernicus Climate Change Service um, is made by reconstructing uh, meteorological and climate conditions of the past, uh, offering a product that has no gaps in space and time for a number of atmospheric, land and waves variables. And, um, and, and of course, um, the, um, of course, the examples that you will see later on is really to, to showcase the added value of a climate reanalysis. Now, this picture here is quite used around, is a nice picture, um, and it is used to, to showcase what a reanalysis is. On the left hand side, you have this image, very famous picture um, from, from NASA, Apollo 17, um, that is the image of the year taken on 7 December 1972 at a certain time. And on the right hand side, you see a corresponding reconstruction of pseudo image that is being generated uh, with a forecast model initialized by this uh, ERA-5 reanalysis, this global reanalysis that I was mentioning. Of course, you can see that there are also some areas with differences, and this is mostly related to the fact that in the southern hemisphere, uh, the reanalysis cannot count to many observations at that time. But I think that from this picture, you may also understand which is the great added value of this kind of product that also why it is maybe among the most popular data. And at the Copernicus Climate Change Service, as I said, we offer those type of data, but we are also users uh, of data, those data that we operationally maintain. And one way of using the climate data was shown by Hugo just a second before, and is to monitor the environment. So this, this slide comes from the latest European State of the Climate Report. Uh, this is a report that is updated, uh, released every year, and it covers the last year conditions. And of course, in practice, it puts the last year in the context of the past climate. Uh, this, this, this report focuses on, on Europe, but includes sections also at the global scale. For example, the year 2021 was characterized by several events, as Hugo was mentioning. For example, summer 2021 has been the warmest on record for Europe, with one degree temperature above average. On the right-hand side, on top, you can see kind of a time series of anomalies, where these, um, I mean, anomalies, anomalous warm summer for Europe in 2021 was put in the context of the long-term monitoring of the surface temperature in Europe. Um, and, and especially, I mean, Baltic and Mediterranean Sea were really experiencing quite exceptional warm period. And if you look now, this zoom in the Mediterranean region, there has been, for example, a very strong um, experience heat wave in July and in, and in August with really record-breaking temperatures anomalies. And much of the northern Mediterranean experienced this strong to very strong heat stress during summer and droughts of exceptional magnitude. And kind of this, this widespread um, dry conditions were also impacting or conducive of numerous wildfires, in particular in Italy, in Greece, and in Turkey. Uh, now, of course, this is an example of the use of the data for a purpose that in this, in this case is the monitoring purpose. And in this report, you will find data like the reanalysis that I was mentioning, but also earth observation in situ data that are used. But of course, they say, depending on the specific application or even the specific monitoring activity that you would like to, to have, you need different requirements. So you require different typology of data. So in, in a very general term, the, the, the climate monitoring exercise requires data that are, for example, long enough. They should be consistent enough because you have to understand what's happening now with respect to the past. So data should be, for example, homogeneous. 
uh, data should be bias evaluated. Uh, any bias should be removed. Um, data should be able to to, to estimate long term trends or maybe to be fit for recreate, recreating the specific climate extremes. So this means that when you offer a data, so you start with the data, you also have to accompany them with kind of tons of quality attributes. For example, are data fit for a specific application? And this is part of the evaluation and quality control activities that is um, part of this operational service that is the Copernicus Climate Change Service offer. But um, I would like to go back a second to the monitoring activities and monitoring exercise. And again, look, look back at this year 2021 and we look, for example, at the wind. See, the, the wind in 2021 was quite special in the sense that annual mean wind speed was below average in part of Europe. In, the, in this figure, you can see this bluish area that our area where, um, I mean, the conditions were uh, lower. Actually, the plot is on the left hand side is really showing what we call the ranking of um, this uh, annual average 100 meter wind speed. So, in practice, going from the lowest to the highest, in practice, when you have very blue area, this means that this is where the year 2021 was the lowest on record. And we have seen that some areas like Ireland, UK, Denmark, Germany uh, were experiencing the lowest or the second lowest average annual wind speed in the 43 years of the ERA-5 data record. You can understand how important is have a homogeneous long time series. And on the right hand side, you can say something about the impact, the impact of this low wind on, on the potential generation of the wind power energy. And that this is a step forward in the monitoring exercise. So this because of course, uh, wind power generation is highly sensitive to to to, to wind variations, variations in wind speed, and and, and let's say that um, this figure is also showing uh, that in some countries that are especially among the last producers of energy from wind, there has been a very strong um, potential impact uh, and reduction uh, in the energy generation from wind. Um, but. The energy sector is just one of the sectors, of course, uh, for which climate information is relevant in the energy sector, especially is, is increasingly relying on renewable sources. And if we want to support this energy transition and decarbonize the energy system, the information about the climate is crucial because, of course, climate change and climate variability affect both the supply and the demand of energy. And because of the fraction of renewables in the energy mix is increasing, has increased over the last decades, but the problem is that the system uh, integration is still a challenge because of the intrinsic volatility of these sources. And, and of course, um, this snapshot that you can see here is just to show a snapshot of an application that you can find uh, at C3S um, to explore a data set in near real time, but also uh, in climate projections mode by looking at specific information relevant for the energy sector. So specific energy and climate variables. So climate variables, the temperature, solar radiation, wind, and energy derived variables. Uh, I would like to um, also mention that the energy sector does not consist only of an homogeneous group of people, but it's a kind of a variety of profiles, a variety of economic interests and activities. This is a great diversity and the great diversity means that there is a great diversity of user needs. And what I would like to say is that a lot happens downstream of the C3S service. And I think that the next presentations will showcase you how this is um, really happening. Now, uh, to conclude, uh, C3S, at C3S, we continue and to offer, we offer, and we continue to offer in the next phase, a lot of information covering the past climate, covering the present climate, and looking at the possible future evolution of climate. Of course, the evolution is really user centered. So again, a lot happens downstream of us and in our evolution, we put the user at the center. And this means that the C3S will continue to offer information at those time scales. It's very important to mention that this is free quality and open access um, with the instructions, examples, user support, and there will be some um, highlights on specific uh, um, elements, for example, uh, we offer um, an extension, a new reanalysis set. We continue to offer seasonal predictions, climate projections, um, for example, introducing uh, the interactive uh, IPCC climate atlas for the more experts, uh, but also uh, impacts with information that is relevant to different sectors. This is a snapshot for the weather sector. And uh, I um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Chiara. That was a great overview 
of uh, the C3S uh, service. Um, I'd like to ask the audience if they have any questions uh, for Kiara. So please feel free uh, to write something in the Q&A window on the right. Um, in the meantime, uh, whilst we see if there are any questions from the audience, I'd like to ask uh, you a question, Kiara. Um, so we know that some industries are more susceptible to the effects of climate change more than others, such as agriculture, of course, fisheries, the energy sector, like you spoke of, uh, even tourism. Uh, so what sectors do you think need to improve their climate resilience uh, by increased uptake of climate data, such as uh, the um, what is made available by C3S? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so my first reaction to this question is that I would say there is not one uh, specific sectors, but let's say different sectors may share same needs or may have completely different needs. Somehow, um, um, for example, even within one specific sector, you can think that the uh, specific climate information can be beneficial, but maybe in the same sector, but for different application, not at all. So let's say that the use of climate information um, is in some cases is really mature enough to generate an immediate benefit. An example was this energy sector, and I think you, you will learn this in, in, in the next presentations. But uh, in other cases, um, the information is potentially very relevant, but this is not, the application is not mature enough for this uh, data value chain to fully happen. Uh, and I also uh, say that, um, of course, depending on the case, you have to put a different investment in terms of energy and, and resources. Thanks a lot for that, Chiara. That was great. That was a very interesting presentation. We don't have any uh, questions from the audience, so uh, let's proceed. Um, I would like to introduce Juan Jose Sainz de la Torre, who is the Head of Communications and Marketing at Predictia. Uh, Predictia is a Spanish company with 14 years of experience in applying big data and artificial intelligence to the fields of climate change, meteorology and remote sensing. And uh, thanks to their collaboration with the Copernicus Climate Change Service, Predictia has developed Climajust, which is um, a climate service to get ready to use climate change information. So I'll hand over to Hugh Juan, and you should be able to uh, unmute yourself and share your screen. Yeah. Let's know uh, if there's any issues. Are you able to hear me well? Can hear you perfectly well. Perfect. Then I will share my screen that I hope that you can see as well. Yes, can see it now. Thank you very much. Perfect. So good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, as Chiara and Pedro have, have said, in this session, we are going to focus on Climate Just, which is a service we have developed uh, to get ready to use climate change projections. Uh, I want to make this session like quite of a journey through the value chain, as Kiara has mentioned, going from the, uh, the data providers, the, that in this case is Copernicus and the climate change service, to reach, to reach the end users of the climate change projections. In our case with uh, Climate Just, uh, it's a very broad tool, so they can come from multiple fields, uh, hydrology impacts, insurance, renewable energy, even policy makers. I saw that uh, many of you attending this webinar come from water and climate change, which is very fitting because uh, the use case that I have selected to explain a little bit later involves a hydrology research uh, center here in Spain. And as Pedro said, uh, my name is Juan José Sáenz de la Torre and I'm head of communication at Predictia. But before we start the journey of uh, this value chain, I want to take the opportunity to introduce the company. Uh, like Pedro mentioned, we are a spin-off uh, company from the University of Cantabria. We have more than 10 years of experience in developing climate services, uh, applying big data and artificial intelligence, mainly to climate and weather. But we also touch areas like remote sensing and health data. We offer our service both to public institutions and private companies. And in the area of climate change and climate and meteo, we like to say that we cover the whole time scale from short term uh, present uh, with high detailed uh, weather forecasting to planning for the future with climate change projections adjusted for different sectors, uh, which is what I want to talk about uh, today. But if you are curious and want to talk, please feel free to drop us an email. And we are going to start the journey. 
Uh, I want to go through the whole journey of climate data from the global and regional climate data that provides Copernicus and the climate change service to reach the end user, which can be, for example, a policymaker like the Ministry of Ecological Transition here in Spain. This is one of the cases of uh, Climate Just, the service that we have developed, and I will talk about it more about it uh, in a minute. But in this whole process, I want you to know that we will go from global data to highly local information and we want to end up in actionable, in actions. Because the objective that we, that we have with Climate Just is to transform data into actionable information. And one of the things that I have heard many times, Carlo Buntempo said, uh, the director of the Climate Change Service, and it really stuck, is that it is vital that we move from the petabytes of data to the kilobytes of knowledge. And in this session, we will try to see this in a practical case. And we start with the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Like Chiara said, uh, the key of or the core of the service is the Climate Data Store. And this platform is widely used internationally. It has over 120,000 users in more than 170 uh, countries, and it handles millions of requests every year. I want you to know that without the data and tools that the Climate Data Store provides, our day-to-day -day, uh, at Predictia would be nearly impossible. It would multiply the costs of uh, servicing our clients and the time of the projects that we work with. It's a very complete platform where we can access not only the climate data, but also we can rely on tools, uh, API access, and different applications to consult the data sets. But today I want to focus only on one of the types of data sets that the Climate Data Store offers, which is the long-term climate change projections. Climate change projections, uh, for those of you that uh, may not know about them, are made at a global level, and these are international efforts in which consortia made up of many research groups uh, run models on supercomputers to simulate the climate change uh, onto the future, either uh, globally or regionally. One of these examples is Eurocordex. It's an effort to find out what the climate in Europe will be like in the future and the different climate change scenarios. And they are useful simulations to look at how the climate is going to evolve at a European level. The resolution they have, it's 12 kilometers. And it should be stressed that these are models at regional level. One of the mantras in climate adaptation and climate mitigation is that you need information at the local level to be able to take appropriate action at each location. Because since climate change is going to affect different locations in different ways, the adaptation and mitigation actions that we take, for example, in Santander, where I live, is different than in other parts of Spain like Valencia or Barcelona. Not only because of the climate, but also because of the cultural differences and social differences uh, you have to adapt differently. So having local information is key. And uh, we cannot use the outputs of the climate models at a global or regional scale as they come. They need to be adapted to go from regional or global level down to the local level. And that's what we try to do with Climate Just. To give you a little bit of context, the 12 kilometer resolution that I mentioned from Eurocordex is more or less the extension of the Valderredible, which is a region in Spain that I want to uh, talk about to use as an example. 12 kilometers is the red square that you can see here on screen. Uh, but if we move into the screen, a lot of things are happening within the square. We have mountains that are 1,200 meters high. We have agricultural land at 600 meters high. And the climate between these two points is wildly different. But for the regional and global climate models, this, is, this all falls within the same pixel. To show why this matters and why we have to go beyond this 12 kilometer resolution, I will uh, show now one graph, and it's the only graph in my presentation. And I won't put any more graphs, but it's really important. I, I want to talk about it. This is a real graph for the Valderredible, the region that I mentioned, and these are the warm days. These are days when temperature exceeds 30 degrees Celsius. It's a very important fact, uh, factor for agriculture, 
And in Valderredible, this is a key factor because they depend on the landmark regional crop, which are potatoes. These potatoes have won awards. They are flavorful and they sustain the economy of the region. In Orange, you have the observational data, the historical observations coming from the Spanish Meteorological Service. And if you go to the models, to Eurocordex, you can see that there is a difference between the number of warm days that happen in reality and the output of the raw output of these models. There is a bias, there is a systematic difference. I'm not going to go into details on why this happens. They come from many different sources, the resolution of the models, approximations made by the models, but going into the details would make the talk too technical. But the good news is that there is a number of statistical techniques known as bias adjustment techniques that allows us to use the observational data to adjust the outputs from the models. Uh, in that, using these techniques, we can go from the global and regional projections and adapt them to the local level. So we see that when we use these techniques, we get what it's here in light green, which is a much better fit to the actual observations. We use the past data to adjust the outputs of the models, and then using this, we can go from regional to the local scale information. I lied to you about using only one graph. Uh, this is the same graph, but projected onto the future. Uh, and I, this is why adjusting the biases in the climate models is important because when we are planning for the future, it is not the same for those working in agriculture to expect two and a half uh, to three months uh, with the temperature above 30 degrees than if you take the information from the raw data of the outputs, which says you that with tells you that uh, by the end of the century, you will be more or less on the same situation that uh, you are now. The problem with these techniques is that they have a very high barrier to entry. They are well known in the field of climate research, but outside of the climate community, they are little known. It is difficult to make the, adjust the adjustments because there is no one size fits all adjustment technique. You have multiple techniques and you require technical knowledge. To go through this barrier and, uh, and provide a service that it's easier, that makes easier to use these uh, bias adjustment techniques, Coper the Copernicus Climate Change funded the development of Climate Just that we did uh, joining together with the SIG, uh, which provided the scientific advice. This web service allows you to obtain climate change projections adjusted uh, using only one website and the user can upload their own weather records or access weather records provided by Copernicus Climate Change Service, the reanalysis that Kara mentioned. It is easy to use. You are uh, open to register. And right now we have over 250 registered users coming from 20, uh, more than 20 professional sectors. The use case that I mentioned uh, has to do with IH Cantabria, an hydrology institute here in Spain. They, require, they use Schema Just climate just the service to obtain a, a data set that has one kilometer spatial resolution for more than 20 variables and uh, derived indicators and the projections go 90 years into the future and the different climate change scenarios. The data they produce goes over one terabyte and they use this for uh, many steps on the value chains. Uh, IH Cantabria handles multiple Horizon 2020 projects, now several Horizon Europe projects, and they also have long-standing collaborations with the Ministry of Trans uh, Ecological Transition here in Spain, but also with uh, other regional governments. So what they use this uh, data set that they produce with Climate Just repercutes throughout these many projects that they have. They have been, the data has been used in legislative proposals be made by the ministry. It has been used in nature-based solutions proposal for the regional governments and other uh, research uh, that they conduct. And I would like to close with a quote from Ulrich Beck, which is a German soci sociologist that, that says that the risk we expect are the whip that keeps the present at bay. And in the case of uh, the, the fight against climate change, the data from climate models is this whip that allows us to keep uh, climate change at bay. 
And with this, I think that I return the word to you, Pedro, and open the floor to questions. Thank you very much, Juan. That was uh, really informative and it was really great to be taken on that journey uh, across the value chain and love that reference at the end as well. So we do have one question from the audience um, and the question is, how is it possible to extract climate da data from Copernicus for specific hydrological areas using a shape file? So that's a bit more of a technical question. Um, uh, would you be able to shed some light on that? Well, uh, I don't know, maybe from Copernicus directly, maybe Chiara can answer. In I... the case of Climate Just, what we do is that you are able to draw your zone of interest or upload a shape file to the service. For sure. Chiara? Yeah. Uh, Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. I am muted myself. So it is not possible today to download and to use your own shape file for downloading the data from the Copernicus infrastructure, the C3S infrastructure. For reanalysis, you can select specific box areas as well as for climate projections through this web processing service that will be also enhanced in a later stage. But some data sets are, for example, offered for river catchments, so on specific um, kind of two step origin of grids, but those are specific hydrological simulations. Thanks for that, uh, Chiara. Um, also, Juan Jose, we have a question um, for you regarding your presentation. So, have you seen a trend in what sectors are using climate just to predict climate evolution? Uh, are some sectors doing more than others uh, to support their strategic business planning with climate just? Mm, one of the things that we have seen in climate just is that the quicker uptake was by the research community at first. But then after doing some communication efforts and so on, now the one third of the users come from consultancy companies. So climate just as it is now, it's not a uh, close for the end users, for those working, for example, in agricultural adaptation or so on, because the file that we offer is a net CDF file. But uh, right now we have the, uh, the consultancy companies asking and using the service. And we have also seen the interest in insurance companies as well. Uh, in the case of Spain, I don't know about the rest of Europe, but in the case of Spain, what we see is that this interest is, dry, is pushed by the legislative uh, restrictions that they face. They have to include climate information in their portfolios. Thanks for that answer. We also have one more question from the audience. Uh, they are requesting uh, if uh, you could please provide a link to register for the local level bias adjusted service um, and confirm that this is of course at climateadjust.com. If you could please uh, put that link in the chat, Juan, that would be really appreciated. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move on. So our next presentation will be from Gil Liscano. Gil Liscano is the founding partner of Climate Scale and is a partner of Vortex since 2008. He has much experience in the field of climate modeling for industry applications. And whilst a part of Vortex developing uh, climate technological solutions using cloud computing for, for industry, Gil was also the driving force behind uh, Climate Scale and has since been leading uh, and implementing the project since uh, 2019. Hello, Gil. I'd like to uh, give you the floor the floor. I can see that you're uh, already presenting um, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I think I'm in the shadow a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize. I look like a protector of the guest <laughs> business. <laughs> we can see you. We can okay. see you. Uh, so I'm Jill Liscano. I'm from Climate Scale as well from Vortex and I'm gonna, over the next uh, 10 minutes, I will show you what what we do at climate scale to to provide uh, actionable and useful information for users and, and how this data is, uh, is cooked in, in our system so um, first uh, climate scale is a small company as well based in, in spain we are a Trangian area in barcelona uh, uh, we have uh, about two and a half years of existence uh, before us and there was another company, not before us. No. We, we, we come from another company, we are a spin off of Vortex, that is an existing uh, firm that uh, works on wind resource modeling and 
sim, as well uh, era five uh, data as uh, driven of the of the data down scaling. And at the beginning, we were supported by Copernicus through the use case programs. It was very important, not only because of the funding, but also because it gave us a lot of uh, interaction with the teams in Copernicus to shape the idea that we had behind. So, uh, so the, what, is, uh, what we do is uh, provide uh, localized climate data to evaluate the impact of climate change in, in, in any project. So we focus on applications in the private sector, but uh, we have data can be used for any, 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 any use in, in principle. So as, uh, as in Predictia, yeah, we, we bring uh, to the users uh, information uh, of high resolution of different uh, climate variables that are needed to assess impact uh, for, for projects and then obviously take the adaptation and recommendation needed. But uh, in parallel to all the data services that is uh, provided through our interface, and using our uh, cloud computing facilities and on-demand uh, solutions, we also uh, provide support. And I want to emphasize this because it's one of the lessons learned over the last two and a half years intensively working developing climate scale, putting in place in the project, is that uh, support is fundamental when we want to work with uh, climate projections outside the uh, for instance, academia, where people are, are used to, to, to deal with certain contents like uncertainty, climate projects, and some samples, etc. So, don't, don't, data is fundamental, but having some human to explain you what, what are these data about is, is also very critical. And I will show it a little bit more. So, why, to, why now? to provide this kind of services. There are many reasons, but one that is very important is that now it's very mandatory. It's new, new regulations. I'll just take an example of European taxonomy on, on sustainable finance are making many users from the private sector to, to start incorporating the climate change information as part of all the process. For, for instance, when, when a due diligence needs uh, needs now uh, the uh, risk assessment of impact of climate change impact is now something that is new for many users for many many companies many firms that are working with different applications so so this is one of the motivations that could say okay drives our business models and obviously the second one is, is, is the one we all know for now for years is that we need to adapt to the changes that we see in the climate and this has in, in very important implications because future possible conditions are outside what we know from the base data. So, what, uh, why we, how we, how we respond to this demand? Well, we have an online interface that produce, uh, provides for users different uh, data products that are designed to respond to different needs at different levels of the uh, climate change impact uh, assessments from early risk screening to assess which are the areas and which are the level and which are the metrics and the hazards that you need to look when to impact of climate change. And then we provide as well more advanced data for the users that want to use our data to downstream the specific um, software, the yeah, unconsciously the story. So, in our, in our, in our platform, we, we offer data covering different um, uh, different applications and different uh, hazards. And in particular, we, we have a strong focus on energy because we, it's, it's the area where we are coming from, thanks to the work from, from Vortex, where, where we have a, a, an expertise on wind and solar uh, energy assessment. So why, why now this kind of products uh, or the kind of services uh, climate climate scale is one and every case is another one. So there are, there are plenty of, uh, of uh, new platforms that are emerging companies that are being built now. Because now there is, there is a need of uh, complete data that um, is screened from historical to future projections uh, for where people or users can, can assess impact at the asset level or nearly asset level. So localize this information so they can discriminate which are the impact at different locations, especially if you are a company that have a portfolio of assets and you need to assess which are the 
the, the different uh, implications and different questions and different uh, facilities and infrastructure that you have of the, of the different hazards uh, and the changes that we see in the future. But at the same time, this information that so, so far has been like uh, more on the scientific and academic uh, level now needs to be assessed by users that they don't have the, the, they have the expertise in other fields, but not in climate. They are not used to work with certain types of, of formats of data, and also they need to have the information already post-processed so they can directly inject it in their, in their ana analysis. And sometimes what they need is just a, an Excel table so they can get the data and then uh, continue the, the analysis. Also, I emphasize, it's not only about having the data, having the best localization, the best uh, the platform, the dashboard, but it's also as well to work with the, with the users and, and discuss and have some time, have some time. Even um, as, as we say internally, climate scale, have some kind of climate therapy to, to work very intensively with users to, to understand what, are, what, what, what this means and how to use this, this, this data. In particular, we, we are very motivated at climate scale to develop the storyline sponsor to support with narrative uh, the, the projections that we provide from, from, from the dashboard. So, which is behind our technology? Copernicus. Copernicus is, is uh, at the beginning of all the all the process. We, we rely on data that are from CDS, mostly in reanalysis, because we use reanalysis to calibrate our, our projections. So reanalysis is, is the tool that gives us the higher resolution reconstruction of climate information from multiple variables with uh, as I say high resolution and high frequency over the last 50, even 70 years in, in, in time. So this is critical when looking to changes in climate. And as well, we use, we, we use data that comes from Vortex, our partner company, uh, which are more fo focus, focus on, on wind. So these are high resolution on scaling of era five data, uh, but uh, for wind and solar conditions. This is, this is the, our historical reference data. And then we rely on screen. On the climate projections coming from CMIX, CIMI 5 and integrated CMIX 6, and, and the, obviously the CMIX model are associated to different emission scenarios. Also, everything is, 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 is gathered in our, uh, in, in our cluster, and all these data are usually updated with uh, ERA 5 with the latest uh, data, and CMIX data with when models are, when models are becoming. And our, our value change we, we including as part of our technology uh, only for indoor scaling this data using statistical methods, quantifies uncertainty, post-process all this data so we yeah, narrow all the all this big data uh, into package into products that are easy to handle and then um, we also support model evaluation and many other things that are outside the dashboard but we are there to, to, to support uh, the client. So this is an example of the platform. I'm not going to go into detail because it's open. If you need to, you can register and just play around. And there are some sample data, so it's, so you can get a, basically an idea of what at the end, what is the actual, the final product we get from Copernicus and how we transmit it um, uh, to to the user. So which is the translation service that at the end we have developed. Just to recap, we we provide different products, as I say, they, they, they cover from a screening level. So you need to just have an uh, initial idea of which are the level of risks of different uh, hazards for different locations, maps that give you information or layers so you can cross with other layers of information and work with your own GIS or Google Earth or the platform you use to visualize data. And finally, we provide a time series. This is the the like, let's say our more advanced product, not in terms of the post processing, because actually we are not post processing anything. So we just just give you the, the time series we have done, 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 done scale it. But this is for users that they know how to work with the data, they know how to work with multiple models, they understand what are the different emission scenarios, and how to know, work work with uh, with uh, with uh, uncertainty or apply model selections, etc. So this is for more advanced users. 
So the, my last two minutes of my presentation, I will just give you an idea of how this is in con concrete. We, as I mentioned, we work with uh, when industry is one of our focus market at the moment. Because, uh, we, we, is where we, we come from. We have quite a lot of contacts and so on, thanks to Vortex. And so it was very easy for us to us to, to have the wind industry as our um, taking of uh, having. So in the UN industry, the developers, consultants, and manufacturers that are typically used that we work with, they have a, their own uh, approach to assess energy yield and design parameters for a wind farm in operation. This is something that's based on observation where side the data combined with long term reference data, like for instance, for a five or vortex data. But now the, the new program is that they need to uh, readapt, not uh, or take in consideration, consideration that climate potential futures are different to, to what you can just reconstruct with the service now. Data. So the idea is that, uh, that using the data we provide for, for them, products we, we package, the downscaling, we are, they are able to stress test this information. So we going from the hazard, to the to the actual impact. For that, we, we follow on on the use of what we do with them, the, the the guidelines that, for instance, comes from the European taxonomy. So we need to cover a certain amount of, of, of variables, and depending on the project, you need to look to other or other variables or, or one in specific. And it's very important how to translate this information into in terms of impact. For instance, for a wind. Wind industry, wind farm assets is looking to the revenue, the energy, the design conditions, where the farm is adapted to the new climate conditions, and also how the operation and maintenance need to be as well be considered in the process. So at the end, the, the best, at the end of the journey, that the, the user, with the help of the data, with the support that we can provide it, and with their own uh, knowledge, they are able to. Provide to construct this matrix of risks where they have the hazard levels, the probability of, of, of uh, different changes, of the, and traduce this into different levels of impact. So at the end, they can uh, select which is the color that uh, represents the, best, the level of risk of, this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the site, and then to, to put in place the recommendations and the adaptation method, adaptation that are needed to. To be to be sure that uh, the wind farm or the solar plant is is reliable uh, resilience against uh, future changes. So, this is an example of our of the use of our information. Uh, just to summarize very very quickly. There is quite a lot of more analysis and, and details. But anyway, if you want to know more about how how is the full history, just get in touch with me or. Or if you just want to look how the data looks, just go to exploreclimates.com and you will see it. So thank you very much. Okay, took one more minute. Than what I was expecting. Thank you, Gil, for very much for that presentation. Uh, a great overview of what Climate Scale offers and does. We don't have any questions from the audience, but I do have a question. Uh, a quick question, just uh, um, before we wrap up. Uh, so, mm -hmm. what do you think the main driver is? for the users of your services? Do you think is it is to, say, um, drive mandatory and regulatory reporting and compliance, or would it be to increase revenue, or would it be to uh, protect assets and resources? What do you think the, um, uh, the main drivers are for their use? Well, we, we see, we have seen over the last year a uh, uh, change in, due to the new regulatory frameworks, especially because now, uh, the appetite the stage where we, we identify initially many of the users that has come to real action, especially uh, when, when project developers are in the finance clause and the due diligence, and suddenly they, they see that they need to have this uh, new report that assess physical risk of climate change. So this has been, a, I not say that it's a game change, still is too soon, but it's something that is changing the mentality. So, so from curiosity and appetite to something that is more more practical and say, okay, I need this information, I need this data because otherwise the finding institution 
they're going to tell me you're missing something very important. So this is something that is, is, is really important uh, to underline. Thanks for that. Really appreciate you answering that question. Well, that's all the uh, presentations we have for today in this webinar, but we do have one final uh, question for the audience. Uh, and that question is, uh, if you have enough food for thought from this webinar to further explore the uses of Copernicus climate data for yourself. So if you could please indicate that in the uh, poll, that would be really appreciated. Uh, and then I would also like to, again, thank our speakers for such interesting uh, and engaging presentations and to also thank the audience, of course, for your participation and your engagement with us. We hope you learned something new today about climate data and Copernicus as the observation component of the EU space program. Uh, if you would like to engage more with the uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service or Copernicus or the Copernicus Support Office, you can reach us uh, via the links on the screen, which I'm just sharing now. So you can explore more about Copernicus on copernicus.eu. You can also reach us at support at copernicus.eu. And you can, of course, uh, visit the C3S uh, uh, website, which is climate.copernicus.eu. So thank you very much for participating again. Uh, it would also, we would also really uh, like Thank you. Thank you again um, uh, for participating. Uh, before you leave, it would be appreciated if you could answer a final question in the Slido window, as you can see, um, how relevant you found the content. Thanks again, everyone. Really uh, appreciate the speakers and the audience for participation and engagement. We hope you learned something uh, today and we'll see you next time.